All right, we're back. I think this is part four now. Uh, this is turning out to be very long, but I wanted to get through some of this. Um, they've been talking about IIT for a very long time. Um, I think uh, the next question has to do with Keith Frankish and illusionism more on that. So I want to see what he has to say about that. Eventually get to the Sean Carroll stuff, at least. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in this, in this discussion. So let's jump right back into it. My coffee is now cooled to reasonable temperature, so my throat feels better. If you haven't seen the last video, I was burning my throat on this hot coffee, but uh, now I'm nice and I think the, the Zyrtec has kicked in, the allergies are under control. We'll see how much more of this I can do, then I'll probably have to call it quits. <laughs> we'll see, let's go. Um, so Daniel Dennett has what he refers to as traps, which I mentioned in his book, Consciousness Explained, where he tries to show that we are making these mistakes. And the reason for this is that the reason we're realists about consciousness in the first place is because we're falling into these traps. And if you know what these traps are already, you, you can just go ahead and answer. But uh, if you want an example, Kyle has a good example of a trap. Uh, maybe for the audience, it's, uh, and it gives me more substance as well. Sure, sure good idea. Yeah, you're right. Go ahead, Kyle. Okay. Um, it's all good, too, because now we're invading the, uh, the people's uh, castle, you could say, after the stuff they said about IAT. But, okay, so... There's a bunch of assumptions the illusionists and the limitivists make. Um, so first of all, I'm not an illusionist or an illimitivist. I, in fact, am against those views. I'm a phenomenal realist. And I think that phenomenal consciousness could be physical for all we know. Um, so uh, I have struggled really hard to make sense of illusionism. Um, I've talked to some illusionists and I still am not quite sure uh, what to make of their view. The charitable reading of their view is that they are against a particular theory of consciousness, not consciousness itself. It's hard to square that with everything that they say, but I think that's the most charitable interpretation of the view, um, that there is consciousness. It's just different than we think that it is. Uh, and that the way we think of it leads us into theoretical blind spots. So that's my charitable interpretation of it. But, you know... I've been struggling with Dennett's views just as an anecdote about myself since I was an undergraduate when I first read Quine and Qualia in my philosophy of mind class. And I was like, what the hell? Um, getting rid of consciousness. And of course, quining in the philosophical literature of, on jokes <laughs> means to deny something which is obvious. Um, so when he says Quine and Qualia, he's jokingly saying, yeah, I'm trying to get rid of something which seems like it's obviously there. So I never really could understand that view or take it serious until I got to be very old. And now I sort of have a grip on it in this more tame version where they're trying to go after a particular theory of phenomenal consciousness. Um, do some conceptual engineering, maybe. But uh, as far as like true limitivism, like there is no consciousness and things like that, I don't. I can't take that view very seriously. So I'm sort of on their side in this part of the debate. But let's see how they take it and i've done a few weeks worth of studying into their stuff um but one of their attacks is that we follow something called folk psychology so we think you know we're conscious because we're immersed in it and uh, a thought experiment so that people kind of understand this is um let's say there's a, a caveman um okay so hold on so folk psychology is supposed to be basically the the naive theory of how the mind works that the average person comes up with before they study science of the mind. So if you've never had any psychology class, you've never taken a philosophy class, you don't read books about it, you don't think about it too much, um, you're just kind of an average, uh, you know, work a day, I don't know what, I don't want to say Joe six pack, is that even a word anymore? Whatever, you know, just a person who doesn't care about this stuff. You're still going to talk about minds. You're still going to talk about things like belief and I want certain things and ouch, that's a pain. And you're still going to infer from the people's actions that they're going to behave in various ways. You're not going to characterize it that way. But that's what folk psychology is supposed to be. This kind of ordinary theory of how the mind works uh, embodied in our ordinary way of thinking um, before we start theorizing, if there is such a thing. So... Um, why did he bring up folk psychology? Eliminativists, usually like real eliminativists, like Churchlands, they want to get rid of uh, folk psychology in the sense that, you know, for example, we say, well, there's a thing called a belief. And then you look in the brain and you say, well, where's these beliefs at? 
what we find are these other things. Um, so no, nothing that really maps on to the category of what we would consider a belief. Uh, so the limitivists then say, well, there is no such thing as belief. There's just these other brain states in there. But you still go around feeling and saying the same stuff and so forth. So it's not as though they're denying that people say they believe things, etc. Um, so I've always been on the Fodor side of this, thinking that, you know, folk psychology is kind of obviously true and that the brain somehow must implement it. Um, but uh, thinking about the eliminativist position is is interesting. And, and Dennis' view is particularly interesting because he's someone who wants to say, look, you're not going to find beliefs in the brain, but they, they're not things we can get rid of either. And they're useful in characterizing, you know, folk psychology is useful in characterizing what people do, predicting their behavior and so forth and so on. But that's just a stance that we take a way of interpreting what the, what's going on, but we shouldn't think those map on to states inside their brain in a one-to-one -one fashion such that if we say, oh, he wants to eat an apple, that inside the brain is a state which corresponds exactly to wanting to eat an apple. Rather, there's going to be all this stuff which results in a behavior. Um, so it's an interesting view and thinking about it, I think is interesting, but uh, yeah, I don't accept it and I'm skeptical of it. Um, both the eliminativism about propositional attitudes as well as uh, illusionism about consciousness. So it's interesting they're grouping them together. We'll kind of understand this is, um, let's say there's a, a caveman um, a million years ago and he's near some wood and there's a lightning strike onto the wood and he sees this uh, reaction, whatever happens, and there's some fire on the log and he says to himself, ah, there must be some kind of fire demon eating the wood and he's you know i don't know maybe pooping out fire or something uh and that's that's what's happening uh anyway so <laughs> a flood happens a big ice age occurs and then a scientist finds the um the, the caveman a million years later dethawism or sorry thawism and then um he wakes up and says uh, you know what your stories were and then he explained fire and the scientist laughs and says oh no no there's no there's no ghost eating the fire. It's just uh, it's just a chemical reaction and things and so forth like that. And the caveman says, well, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Why would I have to believe in this kind of ghost when it's just a chemical reaction that's eating the fire and it explains everything? And uh, a lot of illusionists like uh, Keith Frankish and uh, Daniel Dennett mentioned this too. We just don't know enough now. We posit the mind exists, but it really does. And it's just chemicals. <laughs> and, yeah, it's, it, yeah. Okay, uh, so th this is one <clears throat> type of trap. This is the trap of the account of consciousness. <clears throat> the point that this thought exercise makes, it's a valid point, but it's not the point that they think it makes or they, they pedal it to make. The point it makes is that um, our account of experience may be wrong, not that experience doesn't exist. The caveman also experienced the fire. He had a wrong account of that experience, but the wrong account doesn't make the experience inexistent. Yeah, I would agree with that. But um, I mean, what they're, I, I don't think they're talking about consciousness here. I think they're talking about folk psychology. Uh, and that has to do with beliefs and stuff. Although I guess there's some folk psychological stuff about consciousness, but the basic idea is if you learned how the brain fully works, you wouldn't characterize it in terms of beliefs and so forth. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, think about it, it, go into a typical neuroscience textbook and read the chapter on memory or emotions and see if it maps onto what your ordinary beliefs are. I find when I teach this stuff, it, students, it doesn't largely. Oops, sorry, I'm banging things. But anyway, so... Um, but I agree with the point that he's making that this is a critique of a certain explanation of the fire, not a critique of the existence of the fire. Um, their view is that these things are not introspectable. Uh, so, and that we make mistakes by introspection or also that introspection may be theory related. All these things are very interesting, but uh, I certainly agree that I take the first person approach more seriously, I think, than... Um, some of these people were talking about who's emailing me. He experienced the fire, <laughs> even though he had the wrong account of it, you see? So to argue that our account of our experiences are probably wrong 
does not imply that our experiences do not exist. And that's the logical fallacy. You defeated the account of experience and you're trying to sell it as if you had refuted experience itself. No, you only refuted the validity of an account or you... you, you right, made... exactly. And so the way that I would characterize the hardcore illusionists is that what they want to refute is an account of consciousness which includes in it things that we think of as essential to consciousness, like subjectivity and phenomenalness. Um, and they say that's the wrong way to think about the mind. Um, so that's what I, I, so I sort of agree with him that that is what they're doing. Uh, but when they're really in their like full, full final form <laughs> has been revealed. That's what I think that they're trying to do is to, to show that a certain conception of consciousness, one that we think of as essential to it, actually, from a maybe naive point of view, a folk, folk psychological point of view, um, isn't essential to it. Uh, and I mean, I don't agree with them. But I think that that's what they're trying to do. The questions about the possible invalidity of an account. There is another type of trap, which is experience is not what we think it is. That's, that's a valid point, but it also doesn't mean that experience doesn't exist. And an example that uh, Dennett uses uh, is uh, impression. I mean, I don't know. So look, this stuff gets tricky. So, you know, suppose you believe in Santa. Spoiler alert, there is no Santa. But suppose... Suppose someone said to their kid, well, Johnny, you know, there is a Santa. Um, it's just he's very different than uh, you thought he was. So instead of being an individual living at the North Pole uh, with a beard and so forth, it rather is the collective effort of all of society. Parents collectively getting together to put on this giant performance where we pretend to mail letters and pretend to wrap uh, receive gifts, even invite elves into our home to move them around. So, so you could argue, you could, my thing, Santa is real. He's just very different than you thought. It's not a person. It's this collective. But that's what Santa is. Now, I don't know if someone told you that, what would you say? Would you say, gee, that, no, that means there is no Santa. There's something else that's doing all this other stuff. It's, it's not Santa that's doing it. And the person might say, no, no, that's, that, that, that is Santa. It's just that you had a different conception of what Santa was. Okay. Um, now contrast that with someone else who said, no, no, you got it all wrong. Santa is really a skinny four foot um, elf. Uh, you know, people think he's big and fat and jolly, but, but he's really this tiny little elf guy. Um, and, he, and he's very skinny. Um, he, he's not fat. He's very cranky, actually. He lives down the street and he doesn't really want to deliver presents at all. But that's Santa. Um, that's, the, that's the person. You say, well, no, he's not doing all the stuff. So in one case, we have, you know, all the stuff being done, but by something other than what we think it is going on. In the other case, we don't have the stuff at all being done. And we're being told that that's Santa. So your reaction is going to vary in these cases. In one case, you might think to yourself, gee, that's, that, there is no Santa. Uh, um, that's not just Santa being other than I thought he was. It's so radically different that it just means there isn't such a thing. Um, and I think that's a way of thinking about what they want to do. Again, just another analogy, you could take magic. Um, I was having this debate with my son the other day where he asked me if magic was real. And I said, of course, magic is real. Like, you know, you can go and see magicians. They do magic. And he was like, yeah, but those are just tricks. And I was like, yeah, but that's what magic is. <laughs> so, uh, and Dennett has made this point as well. And I think it's a good point. It's like what magic is in the world we live in is tricks. It's making things appear to be a certain way when they aren't. Um, but people think of real magic, quote unquote, as involving, you know, violating the laws of physics in certain ways that match the appearances. So when you tell people, no, this is real magic, and then you do a card trick, they say, no, that's not real magic. You would have to actually make the card disappear and reappear in some way that was very mysterious, as opposed to merely making it appear to be that way. Now, remember, I'm not an illusionist. I just try to be more, my, my goal is try to understand the views that I reject as well as the people who hold them. Um, uh, so, you know, anyway, so that's my understanding of illusionism is that, that, that they're trying to say something similar. What they're trying to say is that consciousness is real. It's just very much other than we thought it was. It's a bit like the parents case I was describing. 
saying that Santa is real. So some people are going to say, no, that's not Santa at all. You're leaving out the essential thing, that it's this guy living at the North Pole. Other people might say, no, that's what you're describing is in magic. It leaves out this violation of the laws of physics. Um, it's just an appearance of, of something happening that isn't there. And these other people want to say, no, that is what magic is. Now, if you think that magic has to essentially involve this other thing, then maybe you're going to say there is no magic. And I think that's what a lot of the debate has actually been about. Excuse me. Painting. An impressionist painting, when you want to, to paint a crap... Right, hold on, I need to rewind. What that, is he talking uh, about? Dennett uses uh, is uh, impressionist uh, painting. An impressionist painting, when you want to, to paint a crowd of people in the distance, you paint little colorful dots. You're not painting people at all. There right. is hardly any recognizable uh, anatomy. It's just very strategically placed tiny dots of painting. And when you look at it from a distance, you think you see a crowd of people. And then, then it says, you see, uh, there is no crowd of people there. You just think you saw a crowd of people. Ergo consciousness doesn't necessarily exist. Well, that's another uh, um, non sectour, another logical fallacy. Um, what he's showing here is that experience is not necessarily what we think it is. In other words, the way we would describe our own experiences depart from the experience itself. We, d we are not always experiencing what we think we are experiencing. Yeah, I would agree with that. But that, of course, doesn't deny that we are experiencing something. Exactly. On the contrary, it yeah. presupposes it. Because to say that what we think we are experiencing is not what we are experiencing means that uh, our experiences are illusions. But it requires the illusion to be there. We need to experience the illusion of seeing a crowd in order for the whole trap to exist. Right, I agree. The question is whether the illusion requires this like phenomenal bit. That's what all the debate is about. Um, like whether the magic requires the violation of laws of physics, um, something non-physical happening. What explains it? So that's what the debate is about. The illusionists say, no, it's just an illusion. There's nothing really magical happening. Where the magicalists say, yes, there is something magical happening. And the other people like me say, it's just physical. Like what? Guys, don't give up the ghost so early. So I don't understand why physicalists always want to jump, jump the ship. I just don't think that you need to budge from square one, which is admitting that the um, hard problem to refuse physicalism. It just, it just doesn't. Uh, so... Anyway, cool. And for us to be able to talk about the trap, if we don't experience the crowd to begin with, if we don't experience the illusion to begin with, then, then there's nothing to talk about. And, 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 and again, that's the, uh, the, it's the same kind of logical fallacy as in the first category. In the first category, we are construing doubts about our account of experience to be a doubt about the existence of experience. These are two different things. The existence of the experience and the account of it are different things. To refute one is not to refute the other. And a very similar Unless, thing happens here. Said. If our description of the experience is wrong, that doesn't mean that the experience itself didn't exist. Unless the description includes some essential attribute. So, you know, again, you can think of so many examples. So think of witches. Are, did witches exist? Uh, well, lots of people were executed for being witches. Were, are those witches? Um, no, not if what you mean is a magical person in league with Satan or something. Um, on the other hand, if you mean like historically people who practice a certain approach to, you know, maybe Wicca or something, I don't know. So... These questions are not nonsensical. They're, they're important. Now, when it comes to consciousness, people think it's obvious which way the question should go. And what the Dennett crowd, et cetera, is trying to do is, I guess, to see it's not quite that obvious. But uh, anyway, so I, can, I understand what he's saying and why he's saying it. I just don't like the way he's saying it. <laughs> it only means that it was an illusion. But an illusion, too, is an experience. 
we have to have the experience of the illusion. None of this stuff, none of these traps, and, and this is so obvious, it's embarrassing for the three of us to be talking about it, because we find ourselves in a society that requires a podcast episode in which three thoughtful people are, are, are arguing against what is obviously nonsensical, as if it were needed to argue for it. Uh, but here... Uh, not fair, but I mean, yeah, this is why I couldn't get Bernardo and Keith on the show together. <laughs> are in the early 21st century so let's bite the bullet and 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 and, and acknowledge they need to do that the extrapolation that the illusory nature of experience of or the wrong accounts of experience actually means that experience it, it itself doesn't exist is utterly idiotic it's downright stupid it's only not stupid if you surreptitiously <sighs> redefine. So clearly this is rhetoric that they're aiming because he's mad about the letter. So now they're aiming it at the Dennett calling him stupid. I don't think Dennett's stupid. I don't think any of his views are stupid. They're frustrating. I get frustrated. I've been, you know, for, I think he's very cagey in the way he says things and it's hard to get it, uh, to, to pin him down. Um, I've been wanting to talk to him about that for a long time, but, but you know, whatever, uh, these kind of comments I don't think are helpful. Um, not at all. Word experience to mean something other than the rest of us understands the word to mean. And that's exactly what illusionists do. They go through some... Yeah, so that's why I said it's like conceptual engineering. They're trying to get us to think about the term differently. Whether you agree with that as a good project or not, I, I understand. Like, it's frustrating. I agree. But uh, I don't think it's nonsensical. Tortures conceptual acrobatics to redefine the word construct a straw man and then burn it and say look we proved that that experience doesn't exist no you prove that your uh, idiosyncratic arbitrary redefinition of the word experience doesn't exist but you didn't prove anything yeah well whether it's idiosyncratic arbitrary i don't know so eric switchable coined the term uh, inflate and explode where you take a concept and you load it with so much baggage and then you say, well, that's clearly no good. So I think he's describing something like that. And I can see why you would think illusionists do something like this. I, I do. I, 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 whether they do or not, I don't know, but I can see why you would think it based on what they say. About what the rest of us understands experience to mean. Um, and then there are, there are other ridiculous uh, circularities in illusionism. Uh, since I'm already down a rant here let me just yeah go ahead go ahead kyle i just wanted to say um before you go down that one it's about keith frankish and people have mentioned that they said well isn't an illusion the experience of something he says yeah i'm not really saying consciousness doesn't exist so we're like okay <laughs> but he's like it's <laughs> not what it seems to be but then you can just say what strassen says the seeming the seeming the seem the seem is an experience yeah well it is it's there but it's it's not there I'm like, I don't know where you're going, man. <laughs> don't. It, it, it's torturous conceptual acrobatics. Um, I mean, I've already sort of explained my take on what they would be saying here, so I'll kind of let this pass, but I don't think they're being very charitable. What you have to do when there is an obvious flaw in your line of thinking and you don't want to admit it, you have to go down these ro this roads of hand waving. So let's take Keith Frankish in my rant here. Um, the, what you mentioned first of all i don't know why that i mean i know keith is a very ardent defender uh but and he's also a super nice guy so it seems like you would want to be charitable and interpret his views in the best way you could <laughs> did he sign the letter maybe that's why they're going after keith i don't know if keith signed the letter uh, maybe he signed this iit letter which has got them all angry um in fact maybe he did i don't know i don't know the uh, but uh Keith's a very nice guy, and he takes this kind of stuff personal. So, you know, he's the kind of person you would want to be nice to because they've indicated to you that they don't like this kind of behavior. <laughs> that is if you were trying to be nice to them. So I do think that maybe, um, yeah, Bernardo doesn't care about that, which is unfortunate. It's the most obvious flaw in his argument. Um, it says, we don't experience, we just seem to experience. Well, wait a moment, the seeming is already... But he doesn't say we don't experience, we seem to experience. He says we don't have phenomenal consciousness, we just seem to. So seeming to have phenomenal consciousness is not the same thing as having it. 
Um, because you could seem to have it by believing that you have it. That's clearly not the same thing as having it, many people would think. So I, I don't like this line of argument. It's kind of, this this is kind of amateurish. I mean, you know, Bernardo is a good philosopher, in my opinion, but some of his moves are very amateurish. Um, this is one of them. Experience. So what you're denying is uh, uh, your redefinition of the word experience, not not experience as the rest of us understanding understands, because seeming to experience is in itself already an instance of that which you're trying to deny. And that's just stupid. It's just silly. I mean... To show why this is a bit silly, um, I'm not going to return the insult and call this just stupid, but you can see why it's a bit silly. Um, consider the case of Anton syndrome, which is a case where a person um, is blind. Uh, they bump into walls and they can't uh, walk around. They have damage to their visual cortex, but they deny that they're blind and they claim that they're seeing, that they can see just fine. So maybe you're going to say that the Anton syndrome is a case where they really are have visual experience and it's just that the parts connected to guiding behavior are absent because of the damage. Um, that could, I guess, be one interpretation. Uh, but the usual interpretation is that these people lack the visual areas, so probably they're not having visual experience, but they're having the belief, the delusional belief, that they're having um, visual experience. They believe that they're having experience when they aren't. Um, and they say, I can see just fine. They get up and walk into the wall, um, not missing the door completely. So in Anton syndrome, there would be a good case to be made that they don't have the visual experience that they think that they do um that so it's not the same thing they seem it seems to them in the sense that they believe that they have this experience it seems to them that they're having the experience of uh seeing the door and walking towards it um but they aren't having that experience they're having the belief uh that's one way to interpret it and that's the way i think is commonly interpreted so it's not ludicrous to think that <laughs> there's a difference between seeming in some epistemic way that includes things like belief um, and seeming in the sense of phenomenal consciousness where things seem to you. So they're conflating those two. Um, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> there's another circularity in his argument. He will... So it's not circular. Following Dennett, he will say that... Um... The now, whether it's plausible, that's that's different, uh, but it's not circular. Uh, you know. In his argument, he will, following Dennett, he will say that um, the brain creates uh, these digests of its own experiences. It reports to itself at the metacognitive level a simplified digest of its own activity. And, um, and it's because of this digest that we believe in consciousness. So the point is the following. There is only neuronal activity. There is only neuronal firing, uh, and you know uh, neurotransmitters drifting across synaptic clefts and locking into receptors. That's all there is. When we experience colors and flavors, why do the colors and flavors not look like neuronal firings and neurotransmitter molecules drifting across the synaptic cleft? Well, it's because when the brain reports its own activity to, to itself. It doesn't report on that activity as it really is. It creates a sort of summarized digest of it. And that digest is what we call the colors and the flavors. And the colors and the flavors don't look like the neuronal activity because they are the digest. They are the summary that the brain creates of its own activity as opposed to that activity itself. That's the argument. And it sounds, on, in the first half a second, it, it, it sounds reasonable. But it's... <laughs> entirely self-defeating and downright idiotic because it, look if you think about it for more than two seconds you realize the following if there is only brain activity and neuronal firings what what can constitute this digest that the brain creates well it can only be constituted of neuronal firings and neurotransmitter molecules because x hypothesis and per, per hypothesis there is nothing else well, that's not quite right, <laughs> because in fact, what Dennett has argued is that the mind is kind of like a virtual machine that runs on the hardware of the um, of the brain. So there could be things at the at the you know emulated level or something like that. But uh, you know, generally speaking, 
And in fact, on Dennett's earlier thing, it was just like the speech that was generated. Like you don't really say, you don't really have the experience of seeing red until you say, I see red or something like that, like literally. Um, so that, that's the digest. But I, but I understand what he's saying is that um, it would seem to be something more than the neurons. But like take that belief case. So if you think, well, the simplest case is just seeing red is believing that there's red in the environment. And you didn't tell a story about how brains can believe that just talks about neurons, then what's the problem here? Now, whether that's an account that you want to accept um, of what it is to see red, that's a different story. Uh, well, I wouldn't accept it necessarily in that fashion, obviously, but uh, representationalism being the view that there's something like a cognitive representation of the environment in the mind doesn't commit you to anything ridiculous, like he's saying here, or anything simplistically idiotic. So this is, again, one of those very strange moves that he's making. So the digest the brain, the brain constructs is itself constitutive, constitutive of neuronal firings. So why doesn't that digest look like neuronal firings? Oh, because there is a meta digest then, a, a, a meta summary, right? Well, but the meta summary too can only be constituted of neuronal firings because by hypothesis, that's all, that's all there is. So you're, you're, you're immediately into infinite regress. And, and, and the problem here, why does, it, why does such crowning absurdity come, come across as reasonable in the first half a second? That, that's important because the moment I said it without elaborating on it, it probably sounded reasonable to the audience. You know, consciousness doesn't look, doesn't feel like brain activity because it's a digest of the thing. And a digest of the thing doesn't look like the thing. Yes, but the digest has to be made of the thing. <laughs> so why doesn't the digest look like the thing? Because it's a description. Why did it sound reasonable before we took the next step? And the reason is we confuse the structure of language for the structure of that which language is talking about. Because something comes across... I mean, there's, this is very too simplistic. There are arguments that people have for thinking that there's something in the brain that would be language-like, like language of thought. Um, in fact, there's a, a very interesting paper that came out saying it's been reappearing all over the place, and I, I support the language of thought hypothesis. I like it. Um, uh, but anyway, so I don't think there's a mistake is what's going on, but let's let him have his say. It's well-formed syntactically in language we think that it corresponds to something plausible in reality, which is the thing language describes. So linguistically, to say that consciousness doesn't feel like neurons because consciousness is a digest produced by the brain uh, of its own activity and the digest doesn't need to look like the thing it summarizes, this has a proper linguistic structure. I am using different words, neuronal activity and digest. These are different words. And that difference in words accounts, we think, for the difference in reality. The problem is that it doesn't, because the second word, the digest, is referring to something that can only be neuronal activity as well. The difference. Yes, but the neural activity might instantiate something which is a shorthand description of something more complicated and not in those terms. Um, uh, the analogy they always use is the desktop, desktop icons. Uh, you know, there are no files in my computer in the sense of papers and orderly lists of things, little folders and stuff. Um, but it's useful. It's a useful way to navigate all the complexity at the underlying level. Um, now, what are those things? Well, I see them as images on the screen, but Dennett and company think that they are themselves just bits of data in the computer um, that, that describe things in a different way. And you can use them without the images. So, um, you know, we don't need a screen in to, to interact with a computer. It's just useful for us. But their view is that the brain is like a computer, but without the screen, where there's a printout. The screen is a second step um, that enables someone else to read it out. But of course, if you were the computer, you wouldn't need that, according to them. Again, I don't really have this view, but I don't think they're being fair to it. It's, in, it's only in the language we use, the words we choose. We chose different words to 
to express a difference. And that comes across as reasonable because of the difference in words. But the thing that is being referred to by the words logically must perforce be the same thing. And therefore, you didn't account for the experience, for, for, for the difference at all. You did not account for the difference between how experience feels and how brain activity objectively is. It just seems like you accounted for it because of a linguistic artifact. In other words, this is all linguistic smoke and mirrors. It's just as stupid and idiotic as it seems to be once you think about it for more than half a second. It's all just smoke and mirrors. It's a desperate attempt of people who are committed. I, mean, I really don't think we get anywhere calling people stupid and idiotic. So especially people who have spent their whole life thinking about this and writing books. So you may not like it and they may in fact be stupid and idiotic. I don't know, but is, does it really help? <laughs> does it really, is this the level of discourse that we are at? Um, I don't know. I have a fruit fly in a here, certain so view. I don't even have to any not fruit. part with that view, in, in, despite logic and evidence. Well, that's like it's funny. I remember someone said in the in the chat with uh, Keith Frankish. They said that exactly. It's just neuronal fire, so consciousness doesn't exist. And I'm like, well, then what are you? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, I agree that that's a mistake. If it that's what consciousness is that that's not getting rid of it so but of course it's a lot more complicated because they're not talking about phenomenal consciousness um so i don't really know how these guys think about that but uh so i don't think that this has been very fair or charitable but i don't think they're trying to be they're you know whatever amongst themselves okay uh are they going to continue but this here's last pile one. On? um you already kind of touched on it it was just um so keith frankish uh he's posited that we conscious realists um have a deep problem when we separate feel from function, so you already mentioned that, basically, and that it is extremely extravagant. Uh, he states that when we do this separation, uh, he would just apply a modus tollens and not make a separation. Um, but you think about it, and you say, like, we, we we idealists, we don't need to do this, though. Function or behavior is the appearance of the phenomenal, or as some just say, the intrinsic nature is phenomenal, and hence it is just a phenomenal. So... I don't see how that, anyway. It doesn't. It's another instance of question begging. In other words, is circular reasoning. Um, it's only obvious that feel and function cannot be separated if you make physicalist assumptions that function is the source of the feel. Or, or... But look, so the, the issue here is that Frankish is going on about is... Um, had to do with like consumability arguments. So if you think that zombies are possible, then you think that you could do everything that you normally do all the time without consciousness at all. So that includes everything, like zombies, philosophical zombies have children, experience trauma to their body, say things like that, it hurts, act in every way, cry, um, say, please stop, beg for their life and being tortured, exclaim for joy when winning the lottery, uh, say how delicious their favorite food is, um, have discussions about consciousness, say consciousness is so puzzling. So philosophical zombies have all of those properties. And what Frankish is pointing out is that that seems very strange because basically you're saying like, well, so what function does consciousness have then if we can do everything without it so that you've separated, so that it's not really... The, the, the experience of pain which causes you to do anything because all of that could be done without the experience of pain. The experience of pain is, is there, but it's not causing anything because that's what the zombie argument suggests, um, that it doesn't play any role because all the stuff can be done without it. So that's the thing that Frankish is trying to point out, that that's very strange. Um, uh, and that's something that I, that I would agree with, that I don't think the conceivability of zombies is very odd. Um, that, that I don't think people really do what they're supposed to do when they try to conceive a zombie. Some people do, um, but uh, it's really hard to really get your mind around how much, like they all the stuff we're talking about would be there without any consciousness. Um, so that's the part that he says you're separating the feel from the function because the reason we do anything isn't ultimately consciousness because that could all be done without it. That's the structure of the argument. So I don't know if they're really addressing this at all. The generator of, of the feeling. 
only under that assumption can you derive the conclusion that you cannot separate the two. Because if one is uh, the effect of the other, separating them is merely nominal. Or at least it's a separation in time, but not a separation in essence. So yes, he is right in deriving that conclusion, but only if you start with physicalist assumptions, which of course is precisely the point in contention. Wait, you cannot argue against an alternative to physicalism by using the assumptions of physicalism in your argument. That's, that's begging the question, that's circular reasoning. Um, and give he's you... not using the assumption of physicalism, he's saying that according to the dualists, consciousness seems separated from function. In fact, that's one of the key premises in their argument, is that consciousness doesn't seem to have anything to do with structure or function. Um, so I don't think he's misunderstanding this completely, or I am, one of us is. Another example of circular reasoning um, that physicalists make, they say, it is obviously not possible for there to be a mind outside human beings or outside living beings. Therefore, idealism is wrong because there is obviously a world outside uh, uh, um, uh, living beings. And that wor world then cannot be minded because there is no mind outside living beings. Well, but the notion that minds can only exist within living beings is a tenet of physicalism. No, it's a conclusion reached from observation. <laughs> it's all we've ever seen. So you can reason your way to other conclusions, but all we've ever seen are uh, minds um, in beings that are physical. We haven't seen non-physical minds outside of this. So yeah, that's, that's something you can arrive at, but it's not the starting point. Not of alternatives to physicalism. Alternatives to physicalism would say that uh, everything can be minded, everything can be a mind. And ad admitting that there is a world outside individual minds does not entail or imply that, uh, that such a world cannot be mental. For instance, um, you have thoughts, your thoughts are mental. My thoughts are outside your individual mind. From your perspective, my thoughts are external. Not only that, my thoughts are objective from your perspective because you could measure them and you cannot control my thoughts merely by wishing them to be different. And my thoughts will still be here when you are no longer there and we are no longer talking. My thoughts do not need your presence to exist. They, from your perspective, my thoughts are objective and external, but from their own perspective, they are intrinsically subjective and mental. Their thoughts, after all. So to acknowledge an external mental world under an, an idealist perspective requires... Yeah, so I agree with what he's saying here. I'm not one of these people, I hope. I accept the possibility of analytic idealism. I think it's interesting. Um, if you get sufficiently motivated to reject materialism by the hard problem, then this is a viable view. It's one of the views that should be taken seriously. I agree. Um, so, okay, you shouldn't dismiss it out of hand. No more than to acknowledge that another person also has mental inner life outside your own mind. What the idealist does is to not mistake the evidence for an, an, an external world beyond our individual minds for evidence of a world that is non-mental. I mean, it's not a mistake. It's based on evidence, which is that the things that have minds behave in a certain way. The things that obviously have minds behave in a certain way. The external world doesn't. Um, I mean, I've talked to Bernardo about this, so I know his view on this, but I think he's, it's weird to portray the, the dialectic this way. Strange. Side all minds. Th because that's obviously a step too far. We don't have evidence for the latter. We only have evidence for the former. There is a world outside our individual minds, not evidence for a world that is itself not mental. What, what is the evidence for that? There isn't yeah, such, a, such evidence. But for the physicalist, because under physicalist premises, mind is always created by a nervous system, there cannot be an external world that is mental. But again, this is circular reasoning. It only applies under the premises of physicalism, which are ver the very things in contention. The problem is that many physicalists 
especially illusionists, people who derive from that uh, period of darkness in human thought called behaviorism <laughs> uh, around the middle uh, of the, uh, the 20th century into the 60s and 70s. Then it comes from there. People who <laughs> grew up academically in that philosophical school. The, the Dennett is, is the ah. second generation of that school. No, it, See. it began uh, one generation before, before him with Skinner, you know, Skinner's black box and all that nonsense. Um, so uh, Keith <laughs> is the third uh, generation uh, of that. If you grow up in that environment, it is psychologically impossible for you to think coherently about reality without physicalist assumptions. They, they cannot do that. It's too ingrained. It is impossible for them to, to understand that the evidence for an external world is not evidence for a non-mental world. For the same reason that... No, the what's evidence, evidence for the non-mental part is what we said already, all the behavior stuff. Um, so yes, you can work your way into thinking that this, there could be parts of the mind, what we're seeing that rate behave regularly, um, uh, uh, you know, but wow. Okay. All right. You know, I've been doing this for a while. So how long are we even, how, holy moly, we're not even only an hour into this. I, I guess I'll go to this segment. And your mind are today. not, is not evidence for, for m the non-mental nature of of my of my thoughts um but they can't see that they s literally cannot see that they cannot think coherently about the world without basing their th thought processes on physicalist foundations it it's a strange psychological thing but um, I, i'm convinced that it's real because i don't think keith frankish is Um, is malicious. I, I don't think he's insincere. I, he think, I, I think he does believe his nonsense. He sincerely believes his nonsense. And why he, does he do that? Because the alternative to his tortuous conceptual acrobatics, <laughs> the alternative to that for him is ungraspable. It, 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 it looks even worse than his acrobatics less plausible than his torturous conceptual acrobatics. He sincerely thinks that. He cannot contemplate that with objective clarity. And, and, <laughs> and therefore, the nonsense is spouted out. It, it seems this is, I can't, this is, come on, man. So even though you're saying something with a tone of voice that sounds nice, he's saying something that's kind of mean right here. That's really actually uh, maybe malicious on his part. Um, I mean, maybe maybe Bernardo really believes this, but uh, I've met Keith. I I don't know him very well. I've only interacted with him online, but he he's definitely not malicious. He's definitely, I think, a good philosopher and able to see things. But he's got arguments. Have we addressed any arguments? <laughs> um, no. Okay, so not arguments. Only only psycho psychoanalysis. This is just. I mean, I don't think this is a good way to do philosophy. Uh, I don't, but okay, let's let him finish. See your nonsense, and, and, and look, I'm not saying Keith is a stupid person. He's not. Um, the worst kind of stupid... You're sure only saying his views are stupid, not him. Okay, good. <laughs> let me say it this way. I think he's... We have plenty of reasons to believe that... In, perhaps all other areas of knowledge. He is a clever, intelligent, reasonable person. It's just that he is so tied in with his assumptions that he applies that intelligence that he natally has into constructing obtuse, uh, uh, tortuous, conceptual ways to not acknowledge the obvious, because the obvious for him is unfathomable. So that intelligence gets applied into... I mean, anyone who's ever interacted with Keith, it's just he's very... His time, he spends so much time trying to understand other people's points of view, trying to make sense of where they're coming from, trying to engage in argument, actually in addressing what people say, their actual arguments that they give against his view, always patiently going... I mean, just on when I was on Twitter, I'm not there anymore, but when I was, 
He was just so patient, so nice, so kind, so forgiving, so like things that you can't possibly imagine in the face of Twitter. Um, so I think this is very unkind on the part of Bernardo. Uh, but okay, you know, Bernardo can't fathom illusionism. I also have trouble taking it seriously, but I think there's an interpretable way to take it seriously. I just don't agree with it, but I don't like all of this way of characterizing the intentions of the, of the, of the proponents. In conceptual obfuscations that aim at de deceiving himself and then the rest of the world with that. But that's a side effect. He is sincerely looking for a narrative in terms of which to relate to reality, a narrative that he can buy into himself. Well, everyone and because the clarity of non-physicalist alternatives is impossible for him to see because his whole process of thinking has, has evolved around physicalist assumptions, then the, the, the only path forward for him is to apply that intelligence into constructing increasingly tortuous and abstract conceptual schemas um, to... So, you know, even if you really thought this, it's still valuable for people like Keith to construct these torturous conceptual schemas because, you know, we get to look at the arguments and then say why we disagree with them. So that helps us map out this space of possibilities about where if you start from here, so maybe that you want to look for a reason not to start there. Or can you navigate from here to over there? Or how do these connect? So, so Frankish and Dana and everyone else, they're doing a lot of work filling in this conceptual landscape. You may not like it, and there may be debate about how to apply the labels to the landscape. But I do think it's a valuable thing to do, you know, if only so that it's clashed with the view that we think is more evident, will sharpen our arguments for that view. So it is a service to articulate it clearly, I think. To Even if you disagree rescue with it. physicalism from the clutches of reason and evidence. And, and, <laughs> and goodness knows it requires a lot of cleverness to construct those ridiculous conceptual schemas. It, it's not simple to do that. Um, so that's where the intelligence is applied. So he's not stupid, um, but he applies his intelligence because of other psychological mechanisms in ways that are, are aim at constructing a hall of smoke and mirrors so he can deceive himself and us. All right. So I've already said enough about this. It's very unfair. I wish he would be more fair. It would be interesting to get a conversation between Bernardo and, and Keith. I tried it at one point, but Keith is just not interested in having conversations like this. And many people aren't. In fact, Bernardo isn't. When I saw him have a conversation with someone who treated him the way he's treating these people, he just walked off and said, I don't want to talk to you. And there's a reason. <laughs> because it's not fun to talk to someone who's dismissive and condescending and insulting. Um, so, you know, uh, bummer. But uh, I want to get through some more of this. I don't know how much uh, time I have today. I've already been here for a long time. Um, but I, I will get back to this later because I haven't even got to all the stuff about Sean Carroll, which I think is very interesting, and Galen Strassen and integrated information, uh, global workspace theory. Um, so there's a lot more stuff I would like to hear them discuss. So we'll pick up hopefully later, but I don't know. We'll see. <laughs>